The tournament is officially over. I just finished my round nine game and it was probably the craziest game of the tournament for me. Also one of the craziest games I've ever played. And part of it was due to botched preparation and some hallucinations and then a flurry of sacrifices and a crazy, uh, crazy, crazy finish. So I'm still trying to process it. Um, I just finished maybe 15, 20 minutes ago. And I was playing a, a young kid whose FIDE rating is, I believe, around 2100. Uh, he was having a, a pretty good tournament. And I had only about half hour to prepare for him before the game. Um, I saw that he plays Sicilian, so I decided to play e4. This is my second time playing e4 as white this tournament. Uh, I played e4 in the first round, so we've come full circle. But uh, after he plays c5, in the first round I played knight c3. In this game, I chose knight f3 because I saw that almost every game he had in the database, he's played e6. And I decided to go for a pet line of mine that um, I studied maybe back in 2015, 2016. It's a move pawn to c4. And at first it looks a little bit anti-positional. Uh, I'm giving or potentially giving away the d4 square, but uh, it's a very tricky sideline. And in many cases, white will end up playing d4 and go into kind of an open Sicilian Marazzi bind position. Uh, but that did not happen. So in just a moment, I'll show what did happen. There's like a drop of coconut water left. What to do? Uh, I still have uh, normal water, so keep this by my side. So um, he played knight c6. I played bishop e2. And there's some nuances here. The more common move is knight c3, but this allows knight d4, which uh, is actually an annoying line. So bishop 2e2 uh, basically avoids knight d4 because then I can take, and after pawn takes, the knight's not hit. Um, but after bishop e2, there's a bunch of interesting options for black. For one, there's uh, pawn g5, which I did prepare a little bit before the game. Uh, there's also pawn e5, which maybe looks weird at first because it loses a tempo, having played e6 and 95. But uh, it actually makes sense to just clamp down on d4, and it leads to a very closed position. So I was preparing um, e5 and g5 before the game. Um, but then he played knight to f6, which for some reason confused me because I thought I checked this position before the game and I had vaguely remembered that the engine gave e5 with a big plus for white. And I was trying to figure out how white can be better after this move. So I took a bit of time here, but ultimately I just decided to play e5 because I thought I knew the engine evaluation, like it had given maybe plus one or plus 1.5. But I just checked my prep and I realized that I checked knight f6 in this position. And then this is where e5 is given. Actually, the edge is not huge for white. It's only like plus 0.3, plus 0.5. So I completely misremembered what I looked at before the game. So we got to this position and I thought I'm better because I thought I knew the engine evaluation. But uh, e5 is actually just a really bad move because knight g4 and my e pawns overextended. But during the game, I didn't know I was worse. I thought like momentum is on my side. I thought I caught him in some opening, uh, opening prep. But um, let me just show like what I should have done is knight c3, like play normally and then uh, prepare d4 in, uh, in, the, in the coming position. And what if, what if queen c7 here Oh, yeah, queen c7, d4. Yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of what I was looking at before the game um, as well. But anyway, I played e5. He played knight g4. I didn't know like white's already objectively worse, but I came up with the idea pawn b4, which is a really interesting type of gambit that there's only been one game on Lee Chess, no games in the Masters database, so it's almost a novelty. But I came up with this because... I remembered uh, an opening, it's actually the opening named after Anna Crowling's dad. Let me show it. In 1969, my dad, for the very first time, 
played the Beyond Gambit, which was an opening that he invented. Every Frozen says that it's a very interesting opening, so if you don't trust me, then trust Eric Rosen. <laughs> it's a Gambit against the English. C4, E5, Knight C3, Knight F6, Knight F3, E4, Knight G5, B5. This is, uh, what is it called? The, yeah, the Bellin Gambit. Bayon? Maybe Bayon and his dad is uh, from Spain. B5 now. This, yeah. is, this is the Bayon Gambit. This is the Bayon Gambit. This is the Bayon Gambit. Yeah, the first game, in, in the first game is in 1969. So B5, it's a cool move. The idea is after takes black and play D5 and get the center. Uh, and then there's another Gambit that's been trendy recently, C6. Idea after takes, takes, takes. There is this line, D5 takes, takes, knight g3, h5. So the reason why I'm showing both of these gambits is because what happened in my game ended up being a combination of a lot of ideas that you see in these lines. Of course, it would be reversed because black's the one gambiting. But let's go back to the game and we'll see uh, some parallel ideas. Uh, now, of course, if he takes, I'm happy to get the center with d4 and white should have full compensation here. But he played the most critical line is to take on e5. And after takes, takes, takes. Um, I basically saw all of this when I had played. Actually, when I played e5, I, I was calculating this line. And the point is after bishop takes e5, I have d4. Now, I'm not winning a piece, unfortunately, because there's bishop b4 check, uh, which is maybe the only move. Although I have the engine turned on. Engine's giving bishop d6 as an alternative which I was aware of during the game. Um, the idea is after takes, takes my rook is trapped and uh, black is, is winning here. So um, there are a couple ways for black to not lose a piece, but he played bishop b4. I played king f1 and then he played knight to g6. And here I was remembering this gambit against English, this one I, I just showed where the knight's on g3 and black plays this early h pawn thrust. And I'm basically employing the same idea here with pawn h4. Uh, I just want to play pawn h5, kick the knight, and eventually pawn h6. And yeah, during the game, I thought uh, I have full compensation for being down a pawn. The engine says it's minus 1.5 in black's favor. So I really misevaluated, but uh, I, I was feeling good. And I think that uh, that actually allowed me to play better chess a bit later. So he played h6, which is a typical way to prevent me from eventually playing h6. And it actually reminded me of my previous game in round eight, where I was black, I was pushing my h pawn, and my opponent played the move h3 to prevent the same idea of getting the pawn uh, too far. So here I decided to hold off on pawn h5, and I started with queen to b3. He played bishop to d6. And it is a little bit awkward for black because if he plays bishop e7, I would play h5 and the knight is not finding a great square, like either knight f8 or knight h4, but both squares are very awkward. So he played bishop d6 to keep the square open for the knight. And I develop knight c3, he castled. And now I play h5, kicking the knight back to e7. And here I was trying to figure out how to just maximize my temporary lead in development um, and also try and formulate an attack on the king side. I was considering moves like c5 and knight e4 or both of these moves like back to back. But ultimately I decided on the move pawn to g4. And the reason is because black's committed to h6, the prospect of g5 would guarantee the g file to open. And I thought if I can play g5 and rook g1, there's going to be a massive attack and maybe later uh, knight e4 and swing the queen over and get all the pieces involved. So yeah, I had some, uh, some devious plans in mind. He played the move bishop to b8 here, which looks like he's setting up for Fisher random chess, uh, just putting the bishop on the back rank. Now the only developed piece for black is a knight on e7. But the point is he's getting out of the way of the d-pawn and he's preparing pawn d5 to contest the center. So I was considering playing g5 here, but I chose not to because I wasn't sure about the line after takes. And why did I not play g5? 
I forget why I didn't play g5. I was strongly considering it, but I, I chose a different move instead, which looked a little bit more attractive, it was pawn to d5. And the point of this, I'm just trying to clamp down on the center and prevent black from pushing the d-pawn two squares. And I was trying to make it so if black wants to develop this bishop with moving the d-pawn, the only move to do so would be d6, which kills the other bishop. Yeah, we're going to see that both bishops have a hard time finding life in the position. Uh, so here he played pawn to e5, which uh, maybe aims to keep the center closed and also prepare pawn d6 to give life to the light squared bishop. And now I go for g5. He pretty quickly took the pawn, which I wasn't entirely expecting. And initially when I played g5, I thought I would just take back with the bishop and prepare h6. But then I realized it's not so simple. If I take with the bishop, he has a move f6. And black actually gets some initiative. I'd have to retreat somehow, like bishop e3 and then d6. It actually seems like black is doing OK here. Like if I ever play h6 and there's g6 or g5. So I took some time before deciding if I want to recapture. And the move I ended up playing, I was actually very happy with. Because rather than recapturing on g5, I sacrifice another pawn. I play the move pawn to d6. And this is the third pawn I'm sacrificing. Now, he didn't take the pawn, but if he does, bishop takes d6, I would have uh, either knight e4 or bishop takes g5. I wasn't sure what I was going to play in the game. Um, let's say bishop takes g5. But now the point is if f6, I have the in-between move c5 unleashing the diagonal. And this was a reason to give away, or one of the reasons to give away the d-pawn is to eventually open up this diagonal, have the x-ray vision against the king. Now, the other reason to give away the d-pawn was to completely destroy the life of the light squared bishop, which is just having a very hard time finding a path into the game. So he didn't take on d6, which surprised me a little bit. He played the move knight c6, and this allowed me time to play c5. And now I'm holding on to my d6 pawn, and these two pawns essentially kill both bishops. Like, it's so hard for black to activate the bishops. Meanwhile, my bishops have life in the position. I was feeling very, very good here. There's ideas in e4 and h6. And we'll see how uh, the position flows for white. Uh, after he plays king h8, I start with knight e4, hitting the pawn. He defends with f6. And then I play h6. Uh, my dream is to open the h-file. Of course, as black, he uh, he wants to keep the h-file closed, so he plays g6. And around here, actually, like when I played h6, I had already seen a really cool mating idea that involves sacrificing the queen. We're going to see how, how things play out. But uh, the point is to get the pawn to h7. And it seems like the pawn's not going anywhere because the king's in the way, and how do I actually get to the king. I, I want to open up the diagonal, but the structure is very solid. So very soon, we're going to see the idea that allows white to break through. Uh, he played the move pawn b6. I play queen d5. And this move maybe seems random. It seems like maybe I'm trying to pressure the queen side, but I'm setting up the idea as after he plays bishop b7. And I'm pretty sure he didn't see my next move coming. I play the move bishop to c4, and it's already unstoppable checkmate. The threat in the position is queen to g8, sacrifice the queen, and then take and promote to a new queen with double check and mate. And I was a little bit disappointed that my opponent did not allow the, the queen sacrifice for mate, uh, but he did allow... I guess a different queen sacrifice. He played the move king g7 here. And then I promoted. Is this a, a pawn sacrifice or a queen sacrifice? Because I, I end up losing a pawn, but I also lose a queen. But yeah, in the end, it is checkmate on f7. Now, after the game, a good friend of mine, uh, Kostya Kowitski, messaged me. And he was upset that I didn't promote to a bishop. Uh, which didn't even cross my mind. Um, but I already had two bishops on the board. 
So I would have had to like pause the clock and ask the tournament director for a third bishop, which maybe wouldn't be the best sportsmanship. But what did cross my mind during the game is if, let's say, my opponent plays knight e7, hitting my queen twice, I was thinking that it would be funny to play queen g8 and whatever takes on g8. I would take back and under promote to rook. But then I realized I would have to, again, like pause the clock and ask for a third rook. And I didn't want to make a scene. And I also didn't want to be unsportsmanlike. But it would be funny to finish this game with three rooks on the board. And it's super rare that you see a double checkmate with both rooks attacking the king. Uh, what do you call this? Perpendicular? So yeah, that's my tournament. I finished with five and a half out of nine. I'm super grateful for everyone tuning into the recaps. It was super tiring. I had so many games that lasted over four hours and uh, I've not been getting so much sleep. It's been a weird sleeping and eating schedule, but I've, I've really had fun, um, especially with this last game. So do stay tuned for maybe different type of content in the coming days. The Vegas Chess Festival begins... I'm not sure when the recap will go up, but if you're in Vegas, feel free to say hi to me. I'll be here through June 18th or 19th. I have to check my itinerary. But again, thanks so much for, for watching. I appreciate those who watch the full video through. And now I think it's time to shave my beard. Um, I do appreciate everyone in the YouTube comments complimenting my beard and saying to keep it and grow it. It does give me more self-confidence. But um, what's that famous quote? What grows on your face in Vegas stays in Vegas.